Welcome to the Girl Take the Lead podcast, where each week we explore womanhood and leadership. And I'm your host, Yo Kenny. This episode is going to continue our conversation about friendships. And you know, we may continue the conversation into next week as well. <laughs> Nora Jahan got us started with a terrific episode, True to You, Embracing Authenticity and Friendships. And some great questions emerged, like the one we'll cover today. What is it about work friends that make them so special? I'd like to give a shout out to some of my work friends who I know listen to this podcast from time to time, like Narit, Roz, Cindy, Three Marys, Kathy, Sheila, and Jennifer. And when I think about all the other friends that came and went, I get a smile when I remember our time together. So let's celebrate that. So what are work friendships about? Here's some statistics you might find interesting as of April 2023. In the U.S., workers log an average of 36.6 hours per week, and Chinese staff put in 46.1 hours, and Indian employees work about 50 hours. That's a heck of a lot of time at work. (laughs) Oh, yeah. It's interesting to note that most surveys on the world of work focus on where employees want to work how much they want to get paid, and the benefits that matter most to them. And very few of these surveys covered the joy of work friendships and where we'd be without them. In a recent Forbes article, I found this. Excessive workloads, marketplace unpredictability, and diminished social support have taken a toll on employees' mental health. Last year, an estimated 15% of working age adults had mental health issues. Gen Z workers report the highest levels of distress, with 55% being diagnosed with or seeking help for mental illness. Depression and anxiety cost the world's economy about $1 trillion annually due to lost productivity. So it's no surprise that mental health issues are a top priority. And obviously, there's an array of programs that are needed to support workers. In the U.S., 62.1% of human resources experts surveyed said workplace mental health was a top priority. And this article makes the point that one of the most important strategies can also be the simplest. How about promoting friendship at work? Could this actually promote an inclusive culture and mental wellness? Here's what they had to say about that. When employees reach out to each other, work to understand their perspectives, and choose to spend time together in and out of work, something magical happens. Understanding tolerance, empathy, and kindness all grow on and off the job and satisfaction with work increases. The results of a Gallup survey show that those with best friends at work were twice as satisfied with their job in 2022, and that's 32% of those surveyed, than those who didn't, which was 15%, and were consistently more satisfied throughout the pandemic. I began my career in marketing as a product manager and changed jobs 14 times in 42 years. <laughs> okay, so don't be too judgy about that. Gen Zers will do that in half the time. In each phase of my work, I met great women friends and feel like I brought at least one of them along from each of those jobs in my life. Sometimes we were close and other times not. But I totally agree with this article and the author, Artie Rahman, when she went on to say, because of these experiences, I've been able to create a rich and diverse friend network 
that sustained me through the difficult days of launching a startup during the pandemic. My startup is actually this podcast, and so many of my work friends are here (laughs) and continue to be to support me, and for this, I am so grateful. Someone asked me recently what friendship was. And I think we can look at it as a continuum. Like at one end is acquaintances we know and that we meet. And then on the other end is this notion of love and intimacy. So maybe the spectrum is all about intimacy and how we grow into it. And the more opportunity we have, the more that we work at it. Because I do believe that friendship takes work got to reach out to people we have to you know make sometimes just like any kind of relationship the opportunity to be together so maybe that's one way to look at this and maybe work friends are somewhere in that continuum and they continue to grow and grow with us if we're lucky like I've been the Washington Post offered this interesting statistic Gen Z was the first generation to grow up princeless Disney princesses, such as Elsa, whose stories don't end with true love's kiss, and the smash hit 90s sitcoms we all know and love like Friends, Seinfeld, and Sex in the City, made stable, long-term friendships every bit as desirable as romance. In fact, 55% of Gen Z and millennials say Friendship is more important than a romantic relationship. It seems that among younger Americans, the tide is turning on the traditional relationship hierarchy. Let's celebrate that. Yay! The author of this article also did an Instagram poll asking her mostly Gen Z followers to pick which type of relationship, friendship or romantic, they wanted more. The majority of her 71 respondents, or 66%, chose friendship over love. Curiously, the results differ by gender. 70% of those who claimed to value friendships over romance were women. One of the reasons I got interested in this topic of friendship was because I'd seen Argent's campaign about work friends. Argent is a woman's workwear brand established in 2016 and has a colorful and modern approach to workwear. Along with the new brand identity, they relaunched the brand with the Work Friends campaign, celebrating the stories and styles of the ambitious, accomplished women at the heart of Argent. And you might have seen Katie Couric's video as part of the campaign, which I'll link to in the show notes. In that video, she answers some questions like, what does it mean to be a work friend? And what are some qualities you admire in your work friend? And here's what Katie said about that. Some of my work friends are my best friends. You spend so much time together, you go through the good and bad times, triumphs and disappointments together. No one knows you better than someone who is with you during the workday. And she went on to say the qualities she admires in her work friends were someone who works hard, not afraid to put in extra hours, not afraid to get out of their lane or their comfort zone and contribute in other ways, and who loves talking about ideas. I can't imagine what working harder and longer means to Katie's world but does raise a bit of concern in mind. (laughs) But what I can get behind is talking ideas and brainstorming solutions. So how about you? How would you answer these questions? What does it mean to be a work friend? And what are the qualities you admire in your work friend? So think about that maybe. For me, my work friends are some of my best friends, too. And yes, we went through a lot of life together, not just what happens at work, 
but who we are as a person, right? A total person. And I guess that's how I'd answer some of the qualities I most admire in someone. That they know that they are more than just work. They're curious about everything. Willing to question things that went on. And would love talking about the guys (laughs) we worked with. Being honest, you guys. Yeah. I, we talked about boys <laughs> in the workplace <laughs> while well, I was single. But once I got married, <laughs> there was no discussion any longer about cute boys at work. So yeah, friends help us navigate life. To me, that's super important, especially the romantic part, right? And help us integrate work and life for sure. It doesn't work real well to compartmentalize all of these things. I think we walk in as a total person and all of these things kind of come together in the recipe (laughs) when we're at work. And it's so great when someone understands that total recipe. One of the points that the Forbes article made was that developing a broad network at work pays lifelong dividends. Like in the author's case, her circle of friends went on to help each other start businesses. And when I read this, I was struck with the question, how do friendships differ from networking? Because to me, her example might also be an example of networking. So how is it different? So one thought that came to me was that networking could be on one end of the spectrum. And friendship is on the other. So it's like moving through, again, that process of becoming connected and being closer to each other that moves somebody from perhaps just a networking friend to something more intimate. There are people I know who are brilliant networkers, but this introvert really hated the idea of going places and meeting new people where I didn't know anyone for the sake of just growing my network. It didn't feel very authentic to me and frankly still doesn't. But I can see that networking could lead to some nice friendships, as I said, along the spectrum. Kind of reminds me, though, when I think about it, like speed dating, (laughs) which... (laughs) Uh, move on to the next person and keep moving on to the next person. It just doesn't sound very fun to me. There was a 2023 article done by Apollo Technical that said this. Networking is an essential aspect of business and building a career. However, many professionals are still skeptical or reluctant to network, even after knowing how crucial networking is to guaranteeing success. There are far too many benefits of networking to ignore it completely, and the data proves it. Here's what they said. Networking is the most successful way of finding a meaningful job and attaining career success. 80% of professionals find networking essential to their career success. Almost 100% believe that face-to-face meetings build stronger, long-term relationships. And 41% want to network more often. Okay, so when I would hear that, I would go, "Uh (laughs) Uh-oh! Yeah, I know that's what I'm supposed to do. And it was not me to go out and network like that. And here's some other interesting statistics. The stigma against being laid off has prevented many from reaching career success again. Those who were laid off are often embarrassed and less likely to reach out to their network for help. According to LinkedIn, since the pandemic began, Only about 42% of professionals reached out to existing connections for job opportunities, and only 39% have asked people in their networks for introductions. Furthermore, only 35% have made their own introductions to new connections. Now, 
course, this is LinkedIn's business model, and I can see that there's cause of concern on their part about this. But if you still said to yourself, yeah, I know I should do this, and yes, I know it's the best way to get a new job, and you're resistant, I am with you. So how could we reframe this? So it's something we want to do. Here's some thoughts. We can begin by finding out what are some of our beliefs around networking. In my case, I believe networking is inauthentic. And I can do a Byron Katie turnaround on that and ask myself, is it true? We did some episodes on that, and I'll have a link to them so you can use Katie's work to help you look at that and your beliefs too. Maybe some of your beliefs might be, I just don't have time. I don't like meeting people that way. I don't like people. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) You can do the work to examine your belief and ask yourself, is it really true? There could be other beliefs going on as well around shame and embarrassment, like the one that was mentioned about being laid off. And maybe that goes something like, if the person I want to network with really knows why I left my job, they wouldn't want to help me. Mm. And if we're shameful, we can also do some work there to help us see it's not a personal thing. A reminder about what shame is, courtesy of Brene Brown. Brene defines shame as, the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. We feel like something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. Okay, I was laid off or fired five times (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and almost laid over fired four times, but I got out in time. And I encourage you to pass this along to someone you know to see these happenings are not about us or our greatness as a person. We can find our superpower, like mine is caring, and hang on to it, feel good about it, grieve the loss see the fear, learn from it, and be kind and loving with ourselves so that when these times come, and they will, we can bend more like a tree in a storm and not break. Next, I think we can ask ourselves why we want to network. Is it to grow my business? Is it because someone said I should? Maybe it's to find someone who knows someone at a company where I want to apply. All reasons are good. And let's not judge our reason. But we can be honest with ourselves and others. So if we're seeking help, we can ask for it. And others are clear on what we need. That's being authentic, right? You got that right. And we never know where that connection may lead us. It could lead us to some terrific work friends. (laughs) Lastly, I also think it's important to help others as much as we can and make ourselves available. And I think that makes us a little bit more open to asking others for help. Research shows that helping others can be good for our mental health too. It reduces stress, improves our emotional well-being, and even benefits our physical health. In short, doing good does us good. And if we help someone extend kindness and express gratitude, I believe it comes back to us. I'd like to end this episode with this quote, sent with love for you, my friend. I'd like to end this episode with this quote, sent with love for you, 
my friend. If there is ever a tomorrow that we're not together, there is one thing you should always remember. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. But the most important thing is, even if we're apart, I will always be with you in your heart. Winnie the Pooh. Thank you for listening today and we sure hope you enjoyed this episode if you did please leave a comment wherever you listen to your podcasts join our public facebook group girl take the lead or visit our website girl take the lead pod.com we also have a youtube channel where your subscription would be appreciated and by the way we just sent our quarterly newsletter and if you'd like to be added to the list to receive it just contact me at yo at yo canny.com So here's three takeaways from this episode. One, work friendships and their impact on mental wellness are often overlooked. Research indicates that having a best friend at work can lead to higher job satisfaction and a more meaningful connection to the workplace. And a heck of a lot of good fun. Two, the evolving attitudes towards friendships, especially among younger generations like Gen Z and Millennials, challenge traditional relationship hierarchies. They are prioritizing friendships over romance. And three, the traditional networking model may not resonate with everyone, but by questioning and examining our beliefs, we can potentially find a more authentic approach to building meaningful professional connections. So, yeah... I want to keep the conversation going about friendship next week. It's so juicy. So next we'll cover more on the topic of friendship in the area of values and why friendships end. I hope you'll join me for those and I invite you to help me with the episode. Please send me the trait you value most in your friendships. I'd love to include that in the episode. Thanks for being here. Bye.